We are in the state of Alaska and we're out in the eastern Aleutian Islands, which are the large islands in the eastern end of the Aleutian chain, which forms the boundary between the North Pacific Ocean and the Bering Sea. And what we're looking at out here is an inlet of the Bering Sea, which is just to the north of us here. We're in a sort of protected bay, looking at Amaknak Island and Hog Island, which is where the archaeological sites are located that we've been studying. The central research question driving this project is, could there have been sea ice on this landscape in this place 4,000 to 2,000 years ago? And we don't know the answer to that question. Sea ice entering these bays would constitute a massive environmental change. You've seen the boats going back and forth. You see where people's homes are right on the shoreline. If ice were suddenly to fill this bay, it would constitute a really dramatic environmental change. One of the main ways that I can learn about whether there was ice on this landscape and how people might have responded to that ice is to try to reconstruct the environment. And one of the great archives for paleoenvironmental data that might actually lead me to this answer is a clamshell. So that one probably is not useful. There's, there's a whole bag but, of really, really good ones. In yeah, and here's a really nice one. I mean, the first part may, might be a little Chomp. eroded, but you're going to cut it along the longest axis, so that chomp doesn't matter. But yeah, look at that. The most abundant remains we find in these sites are fish and shellfish. So we have literally found thousands of clams, and they are beautifully preserved. They're whole. Those shells contain chemistry and chemical information that can tell us what the environment looked like when people were living on that landscape. We need to go through each bag because they're mixed species of shell and find just the butter clams. Then once we've isolated the butter clams, we need to grade them in terms of how well preserved they are. Not clam. <laughs> Not clam. <laughs> These are good. And then we can bag them all to send to Alabama and put the rest back in the boxes to go back in the shelf. So the reason that a clam works as a paleothermometer is because clams, like other accretionary organisms, grow in rings. And as it grows and grows, it's building its shell from the elements that exist in the ocean water. And those elements change according to the temperature of the water. The shells are made of calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and to build that calcium carbonate shell, they have to uptake oxygen from the marine environment. As temperatures cool, they preferentially uptake more of the heavy isotope of oxygen, oxygen 18. As temperatures warm, they take up less of the oxygen 18. And from that chemical information, you can interpret what the temperature of the water was where this clam was living, which is what you guys, of course, will be doing in the lab in Alabama. So we collected the clams at the Museum of the Aleutians and sent them down to the University of Alabama, along with a graduate student from Boston University and two undergraduates, to work with Christine Bassett, who is a PhD student in geosciences. I'm a paleoclimatologist, and I work in a very small sub-discipline of that called sclerochronology. What we do is look at the skeletal growth of the hard parts of different organisms, like shells, corals, to see what they can tell us about the environment. In the case of what Catherine is doing, it's on an archaeological time scale, and all of the samples come from archaeological shell middens. We take just one of the valves from the clam and we section it on a table saw. Then we cut a three millimeter thick section of the shell that we can use either for isotopic analysis or growth analysis. From there, what we do is submerge it in something called mutt-based solution. That solution will bond to the organic material in the shell, and it's going to etch away at the calcium carbonate. And when you take it out, it will be a nice bright blue, and it'll leave a really nice topography and staining of all of our daily growth increments. We can use the timing of that growth, the speed of that growth, the rate of that growth to understand the environment in which that clam is growing. Now that the clam's been suctioned, we can drill into it. So we use the micromill here. Basically, we want to drill these holes as close together as possible in order to get the best information that we can. And so if we drill in a detailed way in each of these growth rings, we can put those samples into a mass spectrometer, pull out the oxygen, and use that to estimate what the temperature of the water was when the clam was growing. And so the clam shells will help us actually reconstruct the temperature of the environment on an annual or seasonal basis when people were living in that place over thousands of years of time. I find this just mind-blowing that this works that this little creature that lives for maybe up to 30 years can record such profound information about the ocean around it. 
We are taking these samples in the context of an archaeological question, a question about human behavior and how humans responded to an environmental change. But the record we're producing is being done in collaboration with geologists who can produce a really robust understanding of past climate changes from these small organisms and connect those patterns to our current understanding of climate change today in 2017. I think we can say with great confidence that we understand some of these natural periods of change and what we're experiencing now is clearly not natural and is man-made. So it's pretty powerful. <laughs>